right now. I'm joined by my colleague, ABC anchor Terry Moran, our Supreme Court expert, Peggy Noonan of the Wall Street Journal, ABC News special correspondent, political analyst, newly mustached Matthew Dow, <laughs> Incognito. <laughs> and Congresswoman Don Edwards, Democrat of Maryland. And Terry, let me begin uh, with you. You heard some discussion there of the, uh, the decision, particularly on the DOMA uh, case. And I was struck uh, most of all by the, uh, the, the sweep of Justice Kennedy's uh, uh, opinion. And I want to play, show one part of it. He said, the federal statute is invalid for no legitimate purpose overcomes the purpose and effect to disparage and injure those whom the state by its marriage laws sought to protect in personhood in dignity. No legitimate purpose. How does a ban survive that? Those are the three most important words in this ruling. The, the court said Congress could have absolutely no reason. There's no reason that Congress could possibly have to treat gay married couples differently from straight married couples. The court could have just said, Congress overstepped its bounds, shouldn't tell every state what marriage is, let the states decide. But Justice Kennedy's opinion goes further. He picked up the most powerful, the most irresistible force in our Constitution, that principle of equality, and in the broadest and most ringing terms, he framed the claims of gay Americans in that. That's going to be hard to stop for those who don't approve of this decision. I think it was a pretty emotionally written and almost emotionally charged decision. Here's the problem. While the Kennedy decision seems to make a lot of, of suggestions about federalism and the states can decide, the fact is because Kennedy posits as the logic of his decision that one can be against same-sex marriage only for reasons essentially of bigotry and wanting to cause injury. If that is so, as this thing now gets played out in 37 states, uh, Chad Griffins of the Human Rights Campaign said, you asked him, are we going to go referendum, legislative, the courts? He said, whatever it takes. It is very hard to believe that any court in any state won't look at the Kennedy decision and say, the court has spoken to be against same-sex marriage for traditional marriage is unkind by definition and not constitutionally supported. To me, there are many people uh, among conservatives who think, you know what, this seemed okay in some respects, but in fact, we're back to Roe versus Wade. That's, it that's is that's the a, nationalization mm, of this that's decision. That's what seemed to set off Justice Scalia. I want to bring this to you, Congresswoman yeah. uh, Edwards, because he said basically the court would do whatever it could get away with. And I have to say, I, I, I personally look at Justice Kennedy's opinion, sort of agree with the sentiment behind it, agree with the morality uh, behind it. If I were to vote on DOMA, I'd probably vote. I would vote against it uh, as well. But it seemed that Justice Scalia's logic was kind of unassailable. He said, Edith Windsor brought this case. The government said, we're not going to fight it. What are we doing here? Well, I mean, there were plenty of people, both through the amicus process and others, who put the argument forward. I mean, and the court could have come to a different conclusion had it wanted to. I mean, I, I think it's almost three strikes and you're out. DOMA, Prop 8, and the next to go are the state bans, and I think that's a appropriate. Look, we have a debate in our, our state. I mean, I'm from a state marriage. that passed marriage equality on the ballot, but still within some communities, within some of our African-American communities and churches, it's a really difficult issue. But this is about what states do, what the federal government does with respect to its citizens doesn't impact at all what churches and faith communities do within the confines of their, their so churches. So how does this play out, Matthew? Well, to me, this is the court actually trying to catch up to where America is in the 21st century. And if you look at the series of court decisions over the last week and a half, conservatives were mad at this one and the series of ones. Liberals were mad at other, the other series of ones were ready to the Voting Rights Act and affirmative action. Could be, could be angry about it. But the, the country has already decided this issue. The country's already decided about gay marriage. The, whether the states will catch up and Even how Even though long, there's 37 states where it's banned. No, let me give you an example of this. In the 1960s, the court made a decision that bans on interracial marriage would no longer exist. 20% of the country was only for that at that time. Mm -hmm. Today, more than a majority of the country is for gay marriage. So the court is actually trying to catch up to where the country is in the midst of this. I think what the court is dealing with is the ghosts of our past, trying to hold themselves in some tradition, and they're trying to make a balancing act, but trying to kept up, catch up to the 21st century America. But they are letting the country's conversation continue. They didn't nationalize all of gay marriage. And the reason that it didn't happen, Justice Kennedy 
clearly wanted to take the Prop 8 case, and he would have had to done dissent. Exactly, he would have had to done a dizzying about face to run away from the language that he used in the Doma case. It was only the judicial restraint of three three liberals, uh, Ginsburg, Kagan, and Breyer, who said, "No, let's not decide this. Let's let the conversation continue." How does but the it's on a fast track? It is unaffected. I wonder how the conversation is going to continue from here. And let me bring this to you, Peggy, because I'm kind of torn here. You know, you can see the, the heat behind it yep. with Brian Brown and Chad Griffin. On the other hand, uh, you also get the sense that a whole lot of people would just as soon have this conversation go away, not be part of politics. That's true, but I feel like the process now in 37 states, that's a whole lot of states, will, in effect, be a little shorter, more truncated, more strangled than it otherwise would have been on issues like this. We forget as a culture a certain amount of patience, a certain amount of ease, talk about it, think about it, vote, leave it up to the people. It's always better when the people vote. When you get something like a jump ahead on Roe, whatever you think of Roe versus Wade, that'll cause trouble and tension forever. So, so I'm a little disappointed we're not well, going then, the other route. How does route. it play out in 2016? Well, that's a, that's a point. So, the, so again, the, the court is actually way further behind to where the country is. This isn't Roe versus Wade. This isn't interracial marriage. The majority of the country supports gay marriage and a definition of marriage between a, that is broader than it has been between a man and a woman. I think this makes 2016 unbelievably important because who the, there's a number of justices as terry knows that are at that age that they're going to probably retire or something off you know something awful could happen that the whoever's elected president in 2016 is probably going to have at least two if not three court justices and as we saw in these decisions these five four decisions on a series of things one change or two changes in that to me 2016 becomes a no question about important. it but if a ban wow. comes to this court the ban i i think goes down goes down Goes yeah. down. Agreed. Let's move to race and the qu big questions this week about affirmative action and, and the Voting Rights Act. It seems like uh, affirmative action lives to fight another day, maybe hanging on by a thread. The Voting Rights Act apparently gutted by the Supreme Court. It, it, it was gutted, in my opinion. I mean, I think that what the court, um, court did was basically said that there's no way to enforce the strong provisions in Section 5 that um, uh, applies to these uh, preclearance states. And I think that that's a problem. I think that Congress is really going to have to come back, set up a formula. What's amazing to me is that the court um, didn't even give notice to the fact that 15,000 pages of legislative history underpin the last authorization of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's problematic. But it was based on, on, on very old data, Peggy Noonan. It was. It was based on a law from 64 or 65. I think the court's decision suggests that it is not fair if roughly every, it, it is not unfair to roughly every half century look at the realities around you, compare them to the realities when the law was made, see where you are. If there seems to be justification and argument uh, for lifting a part of the act, then they can legitimately do it. It seems to me, however, this is the Voting Rights Act is actually voting rights legislation always, and it's not the Supreme Court's job, it is the Congress's well, the job Congress to work this out. did its job in 2006. The Congress did its job by, you know, two years of legislative hearings, 21 legislative hearings on the Voting Rights Act reauthorization, 15,000 pages of documents, text, te uh, testimony from experts. And just because a law has been in place um, for a, a long time doesn't mean it's not a good one. It, Understood, but I think you can fairly argue that some progress has been made since the 90s. It is, but I mean, you look at these last elections and we've seen time after time where state after state, jurisdiction after jurisdiction, tries to put in place barriers. Are they the overt barriers that went in place in, in 1964? Not necessarily, but they are still barriers to, to, me, to voting for to me uh, African Americans and minorities. To me it's trapped. We're still, tra we're still trapped in a time that in the states that didn't exist. Virginia is a perfect okay. example. Virginia was one of those states, nine states, that was selected out for special scrutiny. Virginia today is not Virginia what it was in 1965. Well, and Virginia was carried by the president twice, an African-American candidate. To me, the restrictions on voting rights are much different 
today than they were then. And I think Congress and the president should deal with it. This is not a 13 state, a 15 state problem. This is a 51 state problem. Terry, and that's the last one. Hard to see it happening in this Congress. It is. The Voting Rights Act is probably the most successful law ever passed uh, in, in this country. There was an American democracy oh, before. It. Statement there. And that one, yeah. there was, it changed American democracy. We have a different country because of the Voting Rights Act. That Congress did decide that even though the formula was old, they found that in those states, voting rights violations are run at a higher rate than in other states. And they made a political decision to do this. This was a very activist decision, but there's no question that the Supreme Court has declared what the law is, and we will find out. The court said, no George Wallace, no need for this. We'll find that out, because uh, the states are going to very rapidly test that.